Um, kia ora koutou. Welcome, everybody. Um, ko Frian Wadia to Koingoa. Um, I'm just going to start us off with the karakia. So, karakia te matanga, manakitia te nehui, manakitia te neruhu, manakitia te nefanao. Tai noa ki tai ne kaupapa. Arahina na korero, arahina na hapa. Arahina na ture nei ki a puta ai te mana. So, bless this meeting, bless this group, bless this family. As we come together for this gathering, guide the discussion, guide the questions, guide the intent, so that we move onwards to greater understanding. Amen. Kia ora and welcome. Um, for those of you who are new to our Natina network um, and haven't uh, met some of us before, I am Frian Radia. I'm a parent of three boys here in Auckland, Kushru, Kayan, and Zeus. And um, they're the ones who take me along on all these journeys and learning pathways in life um, because of the challenges that they face um, because of their disabilities. So um, I'm a parent, first and foremost. I am also a early intervention specialist. I work with Autism New Zealand. I've been an EC teacher um, prior to this, and I've been a community advocate for many years now. Um, just advocating for inclusion and equity for our um, disabled and neurodivergent children. So that's just a little bit about me and um, my whanau. I'm here in Auckland and about three years ago, I connected with Linda and Jace um, and a lot of other uh, people who are doing some fabulous mahi. So just to give you some background how Natina came about, in April of 2021, we had our first network ropuhui, so to speak. And it came about because um, personally, I had had some really negative experiences with my children, um, you know, being excluded from school, and I wasn't coping at the time. So I learned um, about trauma on my own, trying to support myself. And when I realized, you know, um, the importance of understanding it, the importance of healing ourselves um, so we can, you know, be better parents, um, better individuals. Um, that's when I thought it's so important that we start seeing this mahi happening in schools as well. So that's when my, I guess, advocacy and um, efforts to connect with others started off. And that's how I came across Linda and Jace and a few other fabulous RTLBs and teachers um, and I couldn't understand why people were doing things individually and there was no platform, no networking opportunity to share all the good stuff that was happening. Um, our initial attempt when we came together as a Ropu was to advocate to the Ministry of Education and try and get them to support and uh, resource, you know, um, trauma-informed approaches. And that didn't quite work out. So eventually, after conversations for almost a year and a half, we thought, why not just get going on our own? And that's how Natina was formed. So last year in February, we officially um, set up as a charitable trust. And we're, we're sort of, you know, getting our feet um, going, so to speak. And this is one of our teams to start sharing the fabulous work that is already happening. Um, so we hope that Natina is a really good effective platform where you can connect with each other uh, we have network meetings that are every second month and the alternate month uh, in between we're hoping to have these koreros and I thought who better to start off these koreros with Linda and Jace over here so um, I'm just gonna quickly do a little short intro for both of them and then I will let you guys um, talk a little bit about your journey, Linda and Jay. So um, Linda is principal uh, in Porirua at Glenview School, and she is a um, enemy, so neurosequential model in education, um, a trained trainer, actually. So she can now train others um, in this um, speciality. And she has worked with Bruce, Dr. Bruce Perry and she's got a wealth of knowledge in terms of not only the mahi she does, but also supporting others. So how do you support other leaders, principals? Um, and I think, uh, Linda, you work with Kahui Yako in your space as well um, to mm. get them sort of going on the journey and on this waka. Um, and Linda's the first principal I heard say 
that we shouldn't be excluding our children. You know, stand down and suspensions are not okay. And um, I can't tell you what that meant to me, you know, the first time having a principal say something like that. Um, so, so, so yeah, so I know Linda truly, truly be believes sort of, you know, in the work she does. Uh, um, Mahi um, makes a huge, huge impact on children and families and teachers, you know, who um, work with her. Um, Jace, Jace Williams, um, I don't think I need to introduce him much. Uh, Jace has been absolutely fabulous. He's been a principal at Henry Hill School previously, and um, they've won. That's how I found out about Jace initially. They won the Prime Minister's Award um, for being a trauma-informed school. And, um, you know, again, sort of when I heard about what Jace was doing, when I got to hear from him, I just couldn't understand why this wasn't happening more in um, schools across New Zealand. So Jace has since, you know, recently moved out of principalship and he's actually working in the PLD space now, which is fabulous. And um, so he gets to support a whole lot of other principals, schools, uh, leaders who are wanting to get onto this worker. And um, thank you so much, Linda and Jace, because I know how busy you guys are. Um, thank you so much for coming along over here and sharing this, 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 this mahi with us. Um, another thing, Jace actually weaves in the whole Te Ao Māori perspective into the Western worldview and neuroscience sort of approach to supporting our children. And again, Jace is also trained with um, Dr. Bruce Perry, so he is a um a enemy um trained um. Uh, specialist. So um, on to you guys. Let's get going. Um, the first question. So when and how did you begin your journey on becoming neuroscience and trauma informed? Um, and why does it matter so much to you? I, I want to know what really got you going. I've always known that you've done the stuff. And actually, this will be, you know, nice for me to hear as well. What is it that triggered you? What is it that motivated you to take that first step into this direction? So um, who shall we start with? Jace, Linda, you guys decide. Linda. <laughs> uh, okay. Kia ora koutou katoa. Talo falava, talo hani. Um, thank you, Frian. You're just, you're amazing and doing such great work to spearhead this co-papa. Um, so in terms of what what got us started in Glenview, I think was we stumbled upon it, really. Um, we were going through a stage about, I guess, from about 2016 to 2018 when um, we were struggling quite a bit. We didn't really understand. Look, looking back, I know we didn't understand what was going on for our little people, our young people in our school. Um, we weren't serving or supporting them well. We had lots of um, examples of dysregulated behaviours, but actually probably dysregulated adults was probably um, the crux of it. Um, and I think I, I heard a lot of talk. When when I listened to people like our friend Catherine Burkett and Nathan Macari wallace I heard a lot of talk about this book. I have my visual exhibit. The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog by Dr. Bruce Perry. Um, you can see it's a well-worn copy now. Um, so I think the start of my journey was reading the book. Um, and it was the proverbial light bulb coming on. Um, I think most people here will know it and maybe have read it. Um, but each chapter is the story of a child um, who has experienced some version of adversity, whether it's neglect, trauma, uh, significant stress. And Dr. Perry unpacks what's going on for them and their brain, their nervous system, and how he responded. And it just, I think, I just made so many connections to children that we were working with and what we were seeing um, in front of us. Um, and then I passed it on to my number one supporter in, in my school environment, which is um, my associate principal, shout out to Tufaina Foraimo. She read it as well, and I think it was the same sort of impact for her. So from there, we were just, we we're on our way. So from there, we looked up Dr. Bruce Perry. We found out about the neurosequential model in education. Um, our staff all did the introductory course. I did the full training, and then later went on and did the advanced training certificate. Um, 
Yeah, but then, I mean, I am probably the country's number one Bruce Perry fan girl, but I'm not exclusively a one-man band. Um, <laughs> I do like to read other people, Mona Delahook, Laurie Dessertel, Stephen Porges, Bessel van der Kolk, who I'm going to hear later this month in Christchurch. Um, so, yeah, just lots of lots of um, reading and listening to podcasts and watching videos. Always been interested in psychology in the brain. But I think this just made it so relevant for us in our education context. Nice. Thank you, Linda. Chase, what was your starting point? Yeah, tēnā koutou. Um, For me, and just, just to reaffirm, confirm what Linda said, um, she is the number one fangirl of Bruce Perry, uh, full stop. But, um, yeah, for, for me, it had nothing to do with trauma-informed education. It was um, a trip to the States. We were in Apple Distinguished School at the time. Um, I didn't feel like we got enough support in that space. So my idea was to go to uh, Silicon Valley in San Francisco and see what they're doing over there, because that's next level, this stuff, right? So I did lots of visits, went to, say, Apple, um, Google, all those kind of places, all, all the tech spaces, and then I um, visited a number of schools and I stumbled stumbled across this thing called empathy. And I say stumbled because I didn't know what it meant. So ignorant, arrogant, I guess, at the time. And I expected to see in these elementary schools kids engaged in technology doing next level stuff that I was going to be able to take back to New Zealand. But what I actually saw was communities of schools trying to disconnect from technology that were focusing on relational practices that were heavily um, uh, engrossed in social and emotional learning. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I'd heard about it. So what, what's the cell stuff? So that I got really interested in that. So the trip to learn about technology actually became a trip where I returned. And then um, one of the first things we did at our next teacher only day is we started the, the school year with yoga. We we went to a, um, a place in Napier, a long marine parade called... Um, Atiarangi, a Māori celestial compass. And um, I said to staff, you need to wear some clothing that's loose fitting clothing so you can move around in it. And they assumed we were going to go for a walk somewhere, but we we met in the pitch black in the morning as the sun came up and we did yoga. And then we returned to school and we ate together. So this is the start of understanding how important relational stuff was. And, you know, mm -hmm. doesn't matter what school you go to in the country, everyone talks about relationships, but not everyone knows what relationships actually are. And that was the start of us truly learning what it meant. And then um, went back to school, had had kai together, and then we planted a whole bunch of plants. So um, that was the start of understanding what this all meant. And then I guess we went on a journey. We were in a kahuiako. We left the kahuiako because the focus from the ministry, I was going to say at the time, no, the focus full stop is on academic achievement, right? Yeah. So we left because our academic achievement was that we were happy where we were at. And we wanted to focus on social emotional learning and that wasn't that didn't tick the box for the ministry yeah. so we tried to disengage from that system and i'll tell you what it's really easy to join a kahuiako it's really hard to leave one yeah. um the amount of paperwork and bureaucracy that comes into it but but i persevered through it and we left the kahui and that gave us license to start trying something different so we spent time on social emotional learning and then that took me to a conference that i attended in the states um, and Dr. Perry was the uh, keynote speaker. I didn't know who he was. Um, he got up on stage and people started standing and cheering like it was a rock concert. It was ridiculous, but that's who he was. And I didn't know, I mean, I didn't know who he was, but he started speaking and everything he said resonated. Um, we were doing all these things intuitively because we knew they worked for our kids. But after hearing him speak and then reading the book, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, it gave us the words to describe what we were doing through a through a neuroscience lens. And then people started to take us seriously because before that, we were just doing weird, strange things that other people couldn't understand. But when you start dropping names like Dr. Bruce Perry, Catherine Burkett, Nathan Wallace, people start listening. There's a bit more fidelity in what you do. So that was kind of the start for us. And like Linda it was doing the training with Bruce and then taking that learning back to school and our, our conversations around kids changed once we read The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. That's so interesting, Jace, how you mentioned that the, you know, you realised the focus um, in the schools that were doing really well was on empathy 
and um, so I mean, I mean, my oldest son is now nineteen, right? And so I've been um, focused on advocating for inclusion and wanting inclusion to happen, and thinking about how do we make inclusion happen. And, um, you know, I've gone through a lot of different pathways. So I've thought about disability rights and I thought, right, if people start knowing, you know, what my children's rights are, they're going to be inclusive. And that doesn't work. I thought um, if they get the right resourcing, you know, they've got the right funding and resourcing, it's going to make everything, you know, sort out everything and make everything inclusive. No, it doesn't because you don't always have people on board, you know, the waka and you don't have people with the right attitudes. Um, and ultimately, I realized it was the relationships and it took longer to build those relationships um, and it took longer to change the minds and hearts. But it all comes down to the way I look at it is compassion and empathy. And if you have compassion for the children you work with, the community you work with, then you will make that effort to be inclusive. Doesn't matter what wor words you use, what strategies you use. So that's really beautiful. Um and um yeah thank you thank you for sharing that um and linda very interesting um i didn't realize how you had actually um sort of you know attended catherine Burkett's um sort of you know uh training and then sort of um got onto the book from there i've always heard about the book didn't know what came before the book so that was interesting thank you yeah and I think the second part of that question was it why is it so important to us? Yes, why yes. Why does it matter so much? Yeah. To you, you know, yeah. um, I, I always think when when teachers, educators, doesn't matter who, parents, you know, community leaders, if they are invested personally in it, if if you know something really really um means something to them, then they will you know, go the extra mile for it. They'll make it happen, you know, whether you have the resourcing or not, whether you have the right, you know, uh, procedure systems backing you up or not, you will make it happen. So that's why, what is it personally that, you know, draws you to it? What is it that connects you to this mahi personally? It's, I mean, it's just simply the, the potential that it has to have such a profound impact on on children and young people and schools, mm -hmm. ECE centres now, we work a bit more in there. Um, you know, it's it's relatively simple. Yes, we have to do quite a bit of learning, um, and particularly in the neuroscience area, but it can make such a profound impact. Um, and I think we'll talk a bit later about the barriers, but I guess one of my frustrations is not being able to get that message out to enough people that actually we could just change the shape and the face of our education system and later on actually society in general if if we had all schools understanding this stuff absolutely absolutely and, and, and i think it's 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 a personal level like you said for mm -hmm. for me i started to understand myself better i didn't realize i needed to or that there were things i needed to do everyone else around me obviously knew but i didn't know it was self-awareness and then you start seeing people through a different lens, the, the kids you work with, mm -hmm. um, the adults you work with, your family members. So what I, what I see when I work in schools and NEC is that there's always someone in those spaces that connects on a personal level. And mm -hmm. it's that personal level that you can see. It's, it's, to me, it's selfishly, this, this approach has changed my life. For me personally, as a person, I'm a better person because of it. So you want to start sharing that around because you want everyone to be their true authentic self. Um, Dr. Gabo Mate talks about authenticity. And if you, for so many of us, we have to uh, repress and suppress who we are. And when we do that, that manifests later in the body as illness. Why would we want to be sick? But society doesn't always allow us to be our authentic selves. And, you know, um, my biggest learning from leaving principalship is how... And, and I kind of knew it when I was in the system, but how controlling and compliance-based the system is. And when you leave the system, it's it's tough. It's tough to work. I, I don't think I could ever go back into that system and, and teach. I'm happy to work in schools and kindies and teach teachers, but to work in the system, it's like it's so hard. Yeah. And like Linda said, we need to shake this whole system up um, in order to create that societal change that we need because... Every, everything is based on school. All the stuff that we know in society, stuff wrong in society, it's taught and reinforced through the school system. Whether we like it or not, we are the pipeline to prison. Um, so if, we, if we're wrecking things in society through school, the only way to fix it is through school and education, right? 
So, yeah. so to me, it's a very, very, very personal. And I think for me, you know, the whole journey, of course, started with me feeling like I couldn't bounce back. So I started actually, uh, I, I thought I was depressed. I thought I was anxious, you know, and that I wasn't coping because of the discrimination we'd experienced. And I always used to bounce back and I couldn't bounce back. And it was quite amazing when I started understanding trauma and, you know, I realized, oh my goodness, I've been in the fight mode for so long, for so many years, and I had reached that dissociative stage, you know, and I was really... Uh, beyond the fight flight and it scared me when I sort of read that and I thought oh my gosh I can't go on like this because I've got to be there for my kids you know and so for me this was real um, sort of personal you know healing myself but also then looking at if this is me with everything all the buffers the you know right start in life that I got the positive stuff I got um, I wasn't coping and I thought, what happens to our children? Because in the advocacy space, I often hear parents saying things like, my child hates school, doesn't want to go to school. My child, you know, even things like young children as young as nine and 10 talking about suicide and talking about, you know, I don't want to live. I don't have any friends or, you know, everybody at school hates me. And that really sort of, for the first time, I realized what that feels like, you know, I mean, listening to it was one thing. But then to realize it and actually realize where our kids are at uh, in the education system when they've got a disability, when they've got neurodivergence and, you know, they're not always accepted and they don't find that sense of belonging. Um, that really shook me. And I thought, why can't we have this across, you know, um, the different schools? So that's always been my why. And, you know, like you guys, I would love to see more of this across our schools um so i'm really glad we're getting these conversations going and i hope we can you know carry on and again um schools are a microcosm of the society we live in and so if we can shift the schools i think we can impact you know um society in the next few years and i always think if if my children who are disabled you know because non-speaker he's autistic you know Sometimes he stims and he's, he's, you know, different from everybody. But if other children are given the opportunity to learn alongside him, to get to know him and just accept him, you know, when they go out into the world and they become, you know, employers and, you know, teachers and all sorts of different uh, professionals, I think they would have the um, ability to then be inclusive and I think this is the same thing if we teach our children in schools right now how to really be trauma-informed how to you know understand themselves their brain better how to understand you know um, the impact that um, that our words actions can have on others um, I think we can really shift and change the way you know society functions um, moving ahead so that's really fabulous um, to hear all right, next question. So we've got where and who has supported you along this journey? I know you guys have sort of been, you know, self-starters, so to speak. Um, and you've both been in the in, in, in a leadership position. But tell me a little about who supported you and what are the barriers you faced? I know, Jace, you've already mentioned, you know, the system is a big barrier because it's compliance driven. So I think that's, we can, we can say that's one of the biggest barriers. What else, you know, what are the barriers that you faced along the way? And, and also, you know, how did you sort of navigate them and overcome them? Um, so I think first, firstly, my own staff team at Glenview. So I spoke about to find a associate principal, uh, number one, supporter in that context um and just all our staff our board too our board have been really supportive but they've seen especially the ones that have been on the board a while have seen the change um but I think yeah and so then I have like my partners in crime like Jace like Catherine Burkett like our friend Claire Taylor from the Hawke's Bay who I think is the OG NME practitioner in New Zealand first person to train um and then of course you know people in this wonderful Natina community made lots of connections and friends and um had lots of great conversations with people here and then also the neurosequential model um and education community 
well, and in therapeutics as well. Um, and in sport, our friend Joe Ryder. So um, everyone who's in the tribe really <laughs> yes. gets it. Yes. Um, and your yeah, barriers, I mean, there are just some practical things like it would be great to be able to have more time to do PLD with staff, mm -hmm. with, uh, yes. like, with our kaiārahi, our support staff as well. Um, and it would be great to have an uh, unlimited pot of money for um for staff so that we can have a you know relation relationally rich um yeah. environment which which we do prioritize and we do have but um you know finances are always a barrier and then just as I've referred to before the frustration with that lack of understanding at the level of like the national level of uh, policy makers and funders and decision makers and yeah. officials um, I feel government's just changed. It's like Groundhog Day trying to get the new um, government ministers, et cetera, et cetera, on board. So just, yeah, why can't everybody just get it? <laughs> it would be so much simpler if they did. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, for, for, for me, it's uh, first and foremost, like Linda said, Claire Taylor. So um, Claire, I believe, is the only person in the country trained in both the uh, therapeutics and the education model. So um, she works in Napier or across across Hawke's Bay. So Claire came across our school because someone in her, in her, in her staff at MOE said to her, hey, there's, there's a school actually doing all the stuff you say. So she yeah. came across our school and we connected straight away. Um, and then, then after that, for me, it's Nathan Wallace. Uh, visited our school a number of years ago. And, and actually spend time at our school. And, and that, that's the coolest thing because Nathan's really, really busy and, and he spent quality time with our school, spoke with staff, talked to kids and he spent time with me and, and he um, tried to persuade me to go out there and share this stuff. And at that stage, I was like, no, I'm going to be a principal forever. This is what I love to do. And um, lo and behold, not long afterwards, I'm out there doing exactly what he said. So without his total encouragement, I probably wouldn't be doing it. Then after that, it's you, Freyan, because... We sat in a hui, the three of us, yes. and we were discouraged by the system, the lack of professional development opportunities out there in this space, and and wanting to, first and foremost, provide it where it's needed, free, where possible to schools, and realizing that the only way we could do that is through the Ministry of Education um, regionally allocated PLD. Mm -hmm. So to do that, we had to be accredited with a facilitator. So we had that meeting the next day. Linda and I, um, I think we signed the paperwork the next day, and we are already <laughs> already signed up to do it and so you were instrumental in that and, and, yeah. then, and then for me it's it's family and Fano that help keep me grounded help keep me encouraged in this space because shit it's hard it's hard I spend time in schools with people that get it that love this stuff that know it's making a difference but I also spend considerable time mm -hmm. trying to convince to get people on board and it's a struggle and there are days where it's like, man, I'm, am I even making a difference? What's the point? And then you get messages from people that say what a difference it's making for them and that kind of stuff. So definitely family and friends. And then then for me also, it's people like um, good friends of mine, Matt and Sarah Brown from She Is Not Your Rehab. Yes. Also keep me grounded, keep me encouraged. Um, so so those are the most instrumental people. And then like Linda said, when you you meet your tribe, right? The Catherine Burkitts and other people in this space and there's a really cool network of people, like you said, that are doing some awesome mahi in this space. Um, and then I guess the barriers are, shit, where do I start? Um, in the education space, some of the biggest barriers are principals um, because ultimately they make the decisions in schools. So I've spoken a number of different things. So is Linda. You'll have an AP or a DP or a learning support coordinator or someone in the school, Senko, will come and hear you speak encouraged, affirm what they know, they're mm -hmm. excited, they go back to school and someone above them squashes things because it doesn't fit into what they believe is important. And as we know, if we don't deal with the well-being, then there is no learning later on. So definitely a barrier can be principles. Um, sometimes in Kahuiako, um, there's barriers in there too. So again, someone really mm -hmm. is excited about this approach and they, and they do the paperwork and they get you in, but other people aren't. So that's a barrier. Um, just the term trauma is a barrier. It's a barrier for lots of people for lots of reasons. Yeah. Um, and, and I feel like Linda and I are partly responsible for that in this country. When um, 
Linda and, and um, Claire created the trauma-informed educators page. We use the language, right? When we went for the Prime Minister's Awards, we used the language. It's the known term. But that language, that terminology turns off some people. Yeah. Um, so we think, okay, what are the alternatives? But it is trauma. It trauma is. is real and everyone experiences trauma. So so the term's okay. And it's just educating people. So I think yeah, the term can be problematic for some people. But um, barriers, yeah, there's, there's lots of barriers. But um, yeah, with encouraging people around us, we just keep smashing them down. Like something we did as a school was, we knew the system wasn't going to change anytime soon. So we just worked around the system or we went through the system, whatever it took. And, and for us, that was disconnecting first from the kahui ako, And that was nothing against the other people in the kahui, but it was system driven. Yeah. So we disconnected from that. I uh, stopped going to any kind of principals meetings. I don't want to go in and deal with the propaganda and the bullshit. Um, the focus needed to be our kids and our space. So we kind of went insular, siloed, I guess. I don't recommend it. It's, it's tough. But it meant once we got a tick of approval from Aero, we had three years to prove what we were doing was making a difference for our kids. All the data, achievement data, all the health-related data, everything pointed to it was making a difference. Then they left us alone, and that gave us time to really push this trauma-informed stuff, which we did um, in a real short space of time. And um, you have to go through the system or around it sometimes. And, and like Linda said again, Policymakers, government, and Linda and I have had our battles. We've, we've talked to ministers of education, mm -hmm. MPs, and we just keep getting hearing the same narrative back from them. And the part that frustrates me the most is that you have a minister of education like we used to have that is an advocate for trauma-informed practice, but didn't always say it loudly in places. She would say it quietly in places, and that's because we don't all get to be our authentic selves. And that's it, because she knew this made a difference. But, you know, when, when the Ministry of Education continues to peddle out um, products mm -hmm. and systems and models that aren't, aren't uh, what's the word, fit for purpose for us in New Zealand, and then they go around uh, trying to refresh them in some kind of way, mm -hmm. and that's still just, you know, the only way we can truly make it work is to start from scratch rather than trying to rework things, work from the bottom up, because that's how all this stuff works, the bottom up. The neurosequential model was bottom up and, and make it truly responsive. So when I work with schools, I talk to them about, um, there are, there's no model that I believe is going to completely turn things around for you, mm -hmm. but there's aspects of some models that you take from and use the parts that fit well for you and your context and your people, and then you create your own model. Be truly responsive for your community. I think that's the that's the answer. So that's what you do with barriers. You just work around them or go through them. Mm. Um, I love what you said, um, Jace, about the word itself, trauma, and the term trauma. And I've always I've strongly believed that if I were to be authentic, then I need to use that term. And yes, it is a barrier for some, and it is it may be a barrier to you know get whatever funding or get you know people on board but I have actually learned it's important for me to use it if I'm going to be authentic to myself and if I'm not going to um, keep playing to the system you know and I think this is one of the reasons why um, you know at Natina we really wanted to use the term trauma we had so many discussions at all those network meetings do we use it or do we not and we thought, you know, if we go with the sort of the neuroscience and trauma informed, people can pick and choose what do they want, you know, what they relate to better, so to speak. And that's why we finally decided we'll have the name as neuroscience and trauma informed network Ayotearoa. Um, so you're absolutely right. Um, that is a barrier, and um, even even principles, you know, it's the same thing. You know, I I see a lot of parallels, I guess, you know, with with the advocacy around inclusion, you know. If principals are on board, things happen. So I've worked with some absolutely fabulous, you know, principals um, at times and then absolutely, absolutely um, traumatizing principals, you know, at times. And so mm -hmm. um, it came to such a point in all honesty that when, you know, for, for a few years when I, if I met a principal or if I was in a room with principals, um, I actually had a trauma response. 
I literally had a trauma response and, you know, my heart would beat faster. I would be in that fear mode, high alert. And it took me ages to really work myself, you know, and, and, and sort of get myself um, to a state where I could be non-judgmental um, because I didn't know the person even, you know, but but that that trauma response, the trigger, it was just there, you know, if I was around principles. So I think I think you guys have actually helped me mm -hmm. <laughs> to get over it, knowing that there are principles like you out there and others who are doing this work and who are genuinely, genuinely sort of putting our kids, our communities, you know, even our teachers, well-being, well-being at the center of it all. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that, Mahi. Um, look, my next question is all about, tell me a little bit about the key shifts. You mentioned the data, Jason, you know, Linda, you also mentioned how it, it works, it works. And, you know, that that's why you keep doing it. Tell us a bit about those key shifts that you've, ha you know, gained. So I'm trying to get you guys to sell this to everybody who's here, everybody who hears, you know, what are the tangible shifts that we can start seeing? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. So for me, the tangible shift is I have a 19 year old son who is autistic, who is non-speaking, you know, and sometimes he gets frustrated when he's trying to express himself and, you know, I don't understand him. Um, and what I've realized, the more I've understood about neuroscience and trauma informed approaches, the more I understand about how the brain works. Uh, two things. One is I can actually talk myself down faster. So that's the, you know, top down approach the uh brain uh body approach um because you know i know he's coming from a space of frustration i know this is his brain sort of you know uh setting him off it's the nervous system response that he's in and and so i know that so that is one thing but the other thing is i've learned to do the body up you know work as well and i will be th doing things literally there's times when i'm standing with him and i'm you know rocking with him or i'm rubbing his back and even when he's screaming the place down i can find my calm within me just so i can co-regulate him and what that does is i've noticed he calms down faster now so instead of having a meltdown for two or three hours he is now able to calm down in you know 15 mm -hmm for 30 minutes so it's a huge difference for me personally as a parent that's how I see it and um yeah so, so that's a tangible you know measurable sort of outcome for me in my context I just want to hear in your context what are those tangible you know shifts that you've started seeing what are the benefits we've got to sell this to everybody okay <laughs> yeah are you right with me going first all the time, Jay? Yes, go for it. You jump in. And I should just apologize. I'm full of a head cold, so I'm all sort of snuffles and coughs and tissues and things. Um, so absolutely probably um number one is just such a reduction in dysregulated behaviors, distressed behaviors. And I'm going behaviors because I don't yes, like using yes. the word behavior, um, because it has such a bad rap. And it is so much understood, misunderstood. Um, but such a reduction in those incidents at school. So we we used to keep we used to be PP for our school. We have retained some aspects of it that still work for us. Um, so we were keeping the data around incidents, and we went from something like a hundred incidents a term of some sort of dysregulated behaviour that was severe enough to be recorded in our. Um, our records for incidents. Um, so say, you know, getting close to 400 a year down to um, in 2022, five entries in our book and last year, nothing, no entries in our book, um, no stand down susp suspensions, exclusions. Um, so such reduction in that. And then similarly in the work we've been rolling out in the Kahu call with targeted groups of students, we've done a bit of data gathering around that and we've seen so we've had about if we look at about 75 students across the kahu yako who had been identified um for having high frequencies of dysregulated or dissoci in some cases dissociative shutdown behaviors um that we saw a 47 percent decrease in the number of incidents and a 43 percent decrease in the amount of time that um children and young people were staying in a dysregulated state. 
So um, that's just one way of quantitatively, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're measuring that. Um, and a rather non, we're not, you know, professional researchers or evaluators. So it was a bit of a non scientific way, but, um, and there's lots of anecdotal uh, voice and things about the difference that it's made calmer classrooms, more time with children engaged, possibly better attendance at school, great staff retention. We haven't had any staff change at all for the last two years. Um, so there's those things. Um, yeah. But, you know, one of the spin-offs for me, I don't know if spin-off is the right word, but the revelations was actually understanding this work in terms of children's uh, well-being and behaviour. Um, we were also learning a lot and, and seeing the impact it made on our um, disabled students, so our autistic students, our neurodivergent students, Um and I think we, because we were understanding the nervous system, distress of the nervous system, for whatever reason it was distressed, mm. um, and we were understanding regulation of the nervous system better, I just think we became so much better at serving and supporting um, particularly our autistic children. So, um, yeah. It's absolutely fabulous. Mm. <clears throat> Gosh, I hate, I hate talking about data because I don't really care. Yeah. Um, but in saying that, like, like um, attendance data, average of 92%, uh, that's up there when you consider, like, you know, where our average is as a country. Yes. So kids want to be at school. That's the most important indicator. I mean, kids want to be at school. Um, that um, in our community days that we held, which we, we replaced um, parent-teacher conferences because of power imbalance in them, because um, a lack of sense of belonging for some of our community being, because school is a system, whether we're like or not, we are the system. Oh, um, yes. No matter how relational we are, a lot of whanau still view us as a system and bad stuff happened to them in the system, right? So, and through our community day approach, we had 100% engagement for seven years running with that. Uh, and the school, even though I'm not there, still is achieving that same success, so it's still sustainable. Um, so doing something a little bit different made a difference. Um, academic achievement data, um, we, we really didn't track it after national standards because we didn't have to, but our final national standards data was 94% uh, at and above in reading, 90% um, at and above in writing, and 88% at and above in maths. That's in good. particular, our um, priority learners, you know, mm -hmm. the horrible label that the Ministry of Education gives to Māori, Pacifica, and students with special needs, yes. that label. Um, those labelled kids were achieving at that same rate. Okay, so it was an inclusive system. We had 65% um, of Māori students reading above the national standard. So to, to me, this is because of the approach we took um, over, over a number of years. This didn't happen overnight. So, you know, if someone wants me to come and work in their school with Linda, like it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it doesn't change. It takes time. Yeah. But because of the changes we made over time and all the things we had in place, like we started the day with yoga and breath work and uh, somatosensory brain body breaks throughout the day, all these things, um, I guess, eventuated into this this high data later on. Um, but to me, that the indicator I care the most about is it changed our conversations around kids. Um, mm. We At schools, we like to think we, there's nothing deficit in our schools, but there is, and we are very judgmental. Um, that disappeared after this approach and learning about or reading the boy who was raised as a dog, that all went. So that's the biggest indicator for me. Like Linda, pretty stable staff, yeah. um, happy community. Yeah. Um, and that stuff matters more than any kind of anecdotal data, quantitative data to me. Um, so, yeah. So it's a, are we, what am I even selling it? I don't know. Because often schools want that silver bullet. Like what's the thing you're mm -hmm. going to do? It's going to, we're going to do, it's going to change things. And the answer is uh, knowledge and awareness and time. That's the answer. And um, that doesn't always tick the boxes for people. So it's just, it is. It's just being patient and, and trying this stuff and doing all the stuff we say in our values, being using being perseverant and resilient and all the stuff we talk about in schools, but actually modeling that and doing it as adults. Yes. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Um, I really like what you've said about giving it time because this is not something that happens overnight right 
And even as adults, we go down that journey of really unpacking all of it, contextualizing it, you know, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for my relationships? What does it mean for my children? Um, I found this 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 understanding so useful and um in different contexts so not just you know working with my son but I work in the community space right and I do a lot of advocacy and I work with different people with different perspectives and I know previously when somebody had a different perspective from mine or you know they wouldn't sort of understand my perspective um I would get really judgmental and I would get really frustrated. And, you know, my, my whole point was I had to drive my point home. And, you know, again, it was a lot of that fight mode. I would say I would go into that, you know, spiral of I've, I've got to get it done, got to get it done. You know, how do I do it? And I would obsess over it. Um, I've realized I've changed. Now I listen to people openly. I don't have to you know, get somebody to agree to me or understand my perspective. I can be myself authentically. Uh, I can hold my own, you know, perspective. And at the same time, I can create a safe space for the other person to have their perspective, you know, even if it's different from mine. And and it's really different. And what I'm realizing is even in those community conversations, because I'm involved a lot in the, you know, advocacy space with parents, with, you know, uh, different groups, different perspectives. And, um, and there's, there's, there's so much of a lack of compassion, but it's not lack of compassion, purely compassion. It's because people are in that fight flight mode. It's because people are so, you know, frustrated because of the experiences they've had, because of the um, neglect from the systems, the lack of support resources, the continual ongoing discrimination, you know. Um, so it, it, it's 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 really useful, I guess, in all the different contexts. And um, I love what you said, Linda, about the staff retention as well. You know, if if nothing else, hopefully people, you know, um, can see the value in that, especially in this current sort of, you know, um, time where everybody's struggling with sort of, you know, um, staff. So, um, yeah, so there's so many benefits. I like that. I'm actually going to make sure I jot down all those points um, so we can share those points. Thank you. Um, now, tell me a little bit about how has that learning practice of becoming neuroscience and trauma informed impacted you personally? Jace, you touched a little bit about it and you spoke about how, you know, you've gone down your own journey and you've had to do your work. Um, Linda, what about you? What what has, and you don't have to um, share if, if you're not comfortable, but um, has this had a personal impact on you? You know, um, and for me, I think, you know, I've got to be really honest. Um, taking care of three kids, you know, doing all the stuff that I do. Um, I think for me and my husband, our relationship had become quite, um, quite tense because we weren't really connecting. And I think I've gone back to that relational safety and creating connections and really making sure, um, you know, we're not meeting each other when we're in that you know, dysregulated state, but really having the conversations, the the stuff we need to do in in those regulated states, um, it, it's made a big difference for me. Otherwise, you know, it's it's been quite stressful. So I've, that's that's for me personally. That's also been another, I guess, key change, so to speak. Um, better understanding it. But yeah, I just want to hear what what how has it affected you guys personally in your lives, personal lives. Yeah, it's it's definitely that awareness. So one of Bruce Perry's quotes that I heard him say recently was, um, if we are aware of what's going on, of the science, of the neuroscience, we can have something like a 25% decrease in our own dysregulation. Mm -hmm. So I think just, just knowing what's going on physiologically for ourselves, being attuned to that. Yeah. Um, and I just noticed that, you know, at, at school, for example, if I ever have to go into a junior classroom and cover because the teacher's away, I definitely start to get a bit distressed. I mean, I sense re-overload with all the noise and what have you. Yeah. Um, but I'm now I'm really aware of that. And then I can then we just all down tools and we all do some some breath work or put on some music that helps me regulate. Um 
and even just you know when you when you're just engaging in in general life whether it's meetings or mm -hmm. um just people that say things that annoy you you're you're aware of your own level of dysregulation um you have a lot more insight into it and you sort of yeah. reflect on okay so what was it about what they said that triggered me and why did it trigger me and um yeah we're just so much more aware in in many ways um so that that's the key thing and it, like you said and that moves into your personal life as well as your work life um yeah. and the other impact is just the opportunities to take this work out to other educators in particular um schools ECEs as I said kahuyako um and it's yeah I mean it's really it's really rewarding to be able to support other people to make the transformation themselves I worked with a school last year um and they had a wonderful transformation I mean not just due to the work with me lots of other other reasons as well but um yeah it's it's really rewarding that's fabulous yeah but for, for me it's um yeah, it's, there's two key things stick out to me. I was working with a, with a school. It was the first day I was going to work with them. It was a um, the whole day's PLD. And the principal announced me like this. This is someone that I, we've known each other, sorry, known of each other for about the last 20 years, but yeah. don't know each other. And this is how she announced me. Uh, this is Jace. I used to think he was a real asshole. And, I, and I'm sitting there, I'm like, what? <laughs> and it's, it, it, I, I just crack it up inside because the deputy principal at that school worked with me. She was one of our teachers at our school. In a conversation I had with her not long ago, she said, Paradise, you used to be a real dick. And it was, so it's like, it's it's consistent, the feedback I'm getting. And so awareness is definitely the thing. So um, I didn't realize that's how I was perceived or how I was. Mm -hmm. But when you consistently hear that, there's got to be some truth in it somewhere, I guess, right? But I wasn't aware. And um, working lots of principals and, and, and lots of male principals, I'm of the opinion now, and it's just my opinion, but after talking to lots of male principals, as male as males, we kind of hit our 40s, and then we start becoming aware, I think, and and we start getting a little bit wiser, and our mouth slows down a little bit, because before it ran, before our head caught up with it, so there's just an awareness, right? So when I when I hear those things, it makes me laugh, but I was thinking, what, what was I like? But the feedback from the people I love the most, my family, is it's, well, it's not even feedback, but I'm received. I'm different. It's made me a much better person. My relationships and my personal life with friends are richer because of it. Um, I'm a lot more mindful. I people that work with me may not think this, but um, I I do take a second or two now before I respond, and I say respond because before I probably reacted, and and it may have been quality that came out of my mouth. Or it could have just been something in my limbic system. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so it's definitely made me a lot more aware. And um, yeah, when, 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 for me, all that matters to me is that um, I'm a better person. And it's because of this approach, because of the people I'm been around that I mentioned earlier, because of coming across Bruce Perry's book, um, and then learning, like Linda said, from the people like Laurie Desotels and Stephen mm -hmm. Porges, Mona Delahook. Um, gosh, you say Gabo Mate, uh, Peter Levine, all those kind of people is where that learning, and I'm so privileged, um, probably more so than anyone else on this chat at the moment, that I'm constantly in planes or in cars. I have time. I have time yeah. to think about the stuff, time to listen to books. Like when I travel to a city each week, I, I get to listen to a whole book there and back. Wow. So I'm constantly thinking about the stuff. Um, and, and time has been massive for me. So, yeah, it's made a massive impact on my life. And, and um, without it, I'd just be an unaware principal that was probably still a dick and an asshole. So it's made a massive difference. Oh, look, um, thank you for being so honest and upfront, both of you. Um, th this is work that really needs to happen and we need to sort of, you know, make the shifts happen. And... Um, I, I really think the shift can't happen unless we change as individuals. doesn't matter whether we're parents, whether we're, you know, uh, teachers. Um, for me personally, you know, as a parent, I started my journey with a very behaviorist approach. And that's what I was, you know, given by the specialist. And that's what I was told. And so for 
quite a few years early on, you know, I sort of used that approach and, you know, it wasn't working. It didn't sit right, but, you know, professionals were telling me and, you know, so I had to sort of follow that sort of approach. Otherwise I wasn't doing right by my children. And this has been such an eye opener for me in terms of my parenting, my personal relationships, you know, um, even my family relationships, just reflecting back on, you know, uh, growing up, I grew up with a lot um, of love, of affection, all of it. But despite of that, you know, the kind of, I guess, internal dialogues we have and the kind of internal identities we take on uh, based on our interactions um, really shape us into who we are and I think that's again you know it's made me so much more self-aware um I love um, Brene Brown's work and Brene Brown talks about how uh people talk about midlife crisis and she says it's actually not a crisis it's actually you know that midlife awareness growing awareness self-awareness and the need to start becoming really authentic and being who you are rather than people pleasing, rather than sort of, you know, um, showing things under the carpet and sort of pretending like everything's okay. So um, I really think, you know, when you were talking about being in your 40s and sort of, you know, um, starting to make that shift happen, I think um, that that's what happens with us, you know, because we live our life sort of following what's expected of us and we live our life to keep ourselves safe you know Gabo Mate talks about how you know if we had to choose between authenticity and safety you know kids would always choose safety first so and that's what I've realized you know for so many years I've done safety first and even in the advocacy I've done with my boys I've done safety first and um, I haven't fully been authentic, despite sort of being in this advocacy space for so many years. And it's only in the last few years that I've started becoming a lot more authentic, but also a lot more confident. You know, earlier when I did my advocacy for my kids, I did it out of fear. I was just really fearful, um, not sure, you know, um, but I I have a lot more confidence in myself now because I'm more self-aware and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to put in the mahi to be more authentic so i think it's, it's beautiful having that you know knowledge and understanding um right so the next question we've got for you who is um what is it that you are currently doing in the space and what's next for you so tell us a little bit about the mahi you're doing uh how you're influencing also you know if people can get in touch with you or not um, I know you're both at capacity, but, you know, um, just a little bit about what you guys are up to now and, you know, in your space. Yeah, okay. I'll try and be quite quick because I'm aware we're, uh, we want to leave time for questions. Um, so as long as, as well as being a principal, I'm actually stepping down from being the co-lead of the Kahu Yako because I was just starting to feel I was doing a bit too much. Um, but I am staying involved in the in this space um, the relational neuroscience space with the Kahu Yako. Um, I'm training a group um, in NMA this year um, and I'm doing various bits of PLD through the regionally allocated PLD and um, also the CELO ECE that Jason and I are doing at the moment. Um, and uh, I'm going on sabbatical next term. So I'm actually going to Europe, going to... Um, I've got a week in France, but then I'm going to England and Scotland. And my sabbatical topic is um, looking at the high school level, so best practice in terms of trauma-informed education, relational neuroscience at the, well, certainly the sort of year seven to year 13 level, because I feel like we know what to do at the primary level, but it is a different ball game at yes. the high school level. So that's my topic for that. And was fortunate to get a um, Churchill Winston Churchill Memorial Fund uh, fellowship. So shout out to Kath and Freeanne for that support, um, which helps me with my travel and accommodation. Um, and I have a, an aspirational goal to write a book this year. Um, but that's, you know, what's that uh, Fakatoki aim for the stars? And if you fall, let it be to a lofty mountain. So my lofty mountain will just be my sabbatical report, I think. Nice, nice. Linda, can I quickly cool. check in um with you? You mentioned uh 
you mentioned about the the PLD that you're doing. Um, is that just for schools or is that sort of, you know, do you do it across specialists and, you know, others as well? Yeah, well, I, I do do all sorts of bits and pieces, not as much as Jace is doing at the moment, but so we're both associate facilitators with Interlead. So if school, if the the Ministry of Education school regionally allocated PLD continues, then we'll be able to continue to offer that to schools, um, possibly silos and early childhood centres. But I've also got, you know, the few bits and bobs like um, speak at a conference for um, carers, so care, a caregiver conference in September um, and things like that. So, yeah. Fabulous. No limits. <laughs> Fabulous. Jay's yeah, for, for me... Up. Um, yeah, yeah, PLD facilitator. Um, so like Linda said, um, we're doing CELO contracts together, so that's for ECE. Um, love working in the ECE space. Um, to me, if schools are struggling with anything in school, the first thing they need to do is visit um, two places, ECE or visit special needs schools, because there are two spaces where you have to meet kids where they're at. Um, and we say we do in school, but it is kind of optional as well from what I can see. Um, but I would go and visit ECE in that. So I love working with ECE. Um, I do a lot of work with schools through the regionally allocated PLD, like Linda said. And, and, and the beauty of that is that schools access the PLD for free, that it's ministry funded. Um, it's not always easy to get it. Um, the next deadline, I believe it's the final deadline for this year is in May. Um, so schools will have to apply or kahui before then. Um I'm completely booked for this year, uh, which is great, but it's sad at the same time because it just shows that how big the need is. Um, so if people wanted me, then uh, there's next year. Um, and like Linda, lots lots of um, day stuff I do and conference speaking and all that kind of stuff. Um, but but the, the coolest thing for me is working alongside EC and schools um, to not just share the knowledge once, but have that ongoing relationship and connection where we can look at stuff like policies and procedures to make them more inclusive, so they're more equitable for everybody. Um, that's that's the thing I like doing the most. So, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Um, my, I guess my my vision and goal is that, like Linda said earlier, everyone just gets this. <laughs> it's, it's obviously not that easy. But um, that people, and you've said it before, Freyan, that people are not only open-minded, but open-hearted as well. That's the goal. So if we're open-minded, open-hearted, and we meet people where they're at, which is inclusion, um, then we will have an equitable education system. Because currently it's, well, we often hear about uh, the system being broken. No, it was designed to do exactly what it's doing. So we need to have an education system that's truly equitable and inclusive for all. And that would be my vision and goal. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, you know, for me personally, I've been through the journey with my kids and I've got to understand so much more than just our disabled kids, our neurodivergent kids, you know, there's so much of transience and poverty and uh, abuse and other things that impact our children, right, in schools. And um, I guess my hope is that, you know, at Natina, we can really work together, give that platform for people like you, individuals who are already doing this mahi to, you know, carry on the mahi, share the work, and just really create those safe, inclusive, you know, trauma responsive um, schools and communities so that we can have every Akonga, you know, learn, uh, feel safe and thrive in the spaces that they're in. So, look, thank you so much for sharing for this corridor. Um, Really, really appreciate the time you've taken. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to open up um to everybody. And you're welcome to ask questions. We've got Linda and Jay still 8.30. So this is your uh time to ask any questions you might have. Now, just because I'm recording this, I have left the spotlighted I might actually turn not sure I might turn my spotlight off so Linda and Jace can answer um 
and I'm not sure if I'll be able to see everybody. So can you actually put your hand up, the electronic hand, because then I can at least see who's putting their hands up um, here. That'll be really good. Um, so yeah, the floor's open for questions. Any questions from anybody? You take the hard ones, Jace. <laughs> <laughs> What I might do is, because uh, I absolutely can't see um, people, um, just jump in and speak up if you want to ask any questions. Oh, I see Rachel, you've got a hand up. I found it. I, I put questions in the chat. Um, kia ora koutou. Uh, thanks for the talks, by the way, all three of you. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, I asked about the secondary space. I wonder if anyone... Um, you know, has any examples? Chase has already said in the comments he doesn't can't sort of think offhand of many secondary spaces that are like doing this well. Secondary schools. I was just curious. Yeah, how it's looking. If you've had conversations, you know that type of thing. Yeah, I'm not aware of any secondary schools that are like way down the track yet. But I know that our local college, Puri a College, is certainly on the way. They have um one current staff member who's trained in NME and I've got two more on my group this year and then there's another one the DP is actually training in another group this year um, and they've had quite a few sessions with Catherine Burkett um, and we've got our whole water program going on there so I think you know the high schools they're much bigger and there's a lot of staff change every year so it's like Groundhog Day every year having to go back and introduce new staff to um to the co-papa um but yeah I mean that's why I've chosen that as a sabbatical topic because yeah we're definitely not anywhere there near there yet in the high school sector I think but there may be high schools out there I don't know of of course mm, and, and I think I've, I've done <laughs> some work with some high schools and um there's always high schools in Kauiako I work with there's always great people in them that are trying to facilitate change trying to to um, create a trauma informed school, but there's this thing called the PPTA, um, and they're incredibly strong. And what happens is that you'll have teachers in a high school that get very upset about things being trauma informed because they see it as fluffy and soft, and it's not about uh, they they feel like they're losing control and compliance, and they run to the PPTA and they cry about it. But then the PPTA comes down hard on the school. So principals are, and I, I met a principal when I heard this, I thought, okay, so that's that doesn't sound right, but it's becoming more common from what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in primary schools, for the most part, we can kind of do what we want. Um, and in ECE, we can do what we want, but in high school, there's so many restrictions about stuff. And if you think about media in particular, schools are constantly slammed by media all the time, um, by the government, um, and, and it starts at the top, right? There's the high school, there's NCA, the kids aren't achieving where they used to, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so much pressure on high schools and there are people in there that know it needs to change, but it's so hard to change and, and you, it takes a, it's going to take a very brave principal and brave leadership team and brave board to truly create embedded trauma-informed practice over time, I think. Very brave. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure they're out there. So, so we're happy to support and walk alongside them and give any help they need. But um, yeah, I'm not aware of anyone yet, like Linda said, that is really embedding this stuff. I know they want to. I think the the other challenge that I've heard, and I've spoken to a deputy principal actually, um, who who felt they were trauma informed because they had at some point a few years ago done a workshop on trauma informed approaches. And 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 I I wasn't sure that I should extend the conversation to, you know, explaining that's not how it works or just leave it. And I just decided to leave it um at that point. But the the one of the other challenges with secondary schools is because um they are so focused on NCA. So one is the academic sort of, you know, drive that sits there. Um and then the other thing is there's not a real good opportunity to build the relationships that you can build in others, you know, sort of the primary um, setting 
uh, because you have different subjects, different teachers and children move from, you know, subject to subject. And, and so I think that that actually is a barrier because they don't get a lot of that time with, um, you know, that, that teacher to build up relationships and teachers don't get to know um, the children really well enough, you know, to again, build those connections. Um, so, so that, it, in my opinion, that's also a barrier um, sort of that sits, you know, in that secondary space. Uh, but you're right, ultimately it comes down to principles, you know, taking that leadership, being innovators and uh, being bold about the changes that they want to make. Um, Sarah, you had your hand up, I believe. Are you still there? Sorry. Um, yes, yeah, still here. Yeah. Sorry, just there taking a couple of Go for yeah. it. Um, I was reconsidering asking my question, but I, I think I will actually. Jason and Linda, it's been really inspiring um, listening to you. Um, I'm uh, so I, I'm in this conversation as a parent of a disabled child who's now at correspondence school because mainstream school didn't work for him. Um, and I guess if, if I'd come across people like you, I think our journey through the education system may well have been different. Um, so I guess the question is, you know, do you specifically have any advice for parents who are on this journey but can see that the professionals that they're dealing with just aren't um, but still have to do something because it's hurting the children. Hmm. Fran's probably the best one to answer <laughs> that. Um, yeah, I think this is your, this is throwing the ball to you, Fran. Look, um, my, my approach has always been education and it's educating across the levels. So I really think you know, like you say, leadership really matters. Yeah. Um, and it's not just the principal, but also the board. How do you get the board to start, you know, um, becoming aware that this is what is needed? How do you support uh, the teachers? So giving them little bits of information, you know, digestible, tiny little snippets um, of information. And then also looking at the community. How can we start those conversations in the community? Because sometimes, um, you know, for our children, especially our disabled neurodivergent children, the barriers are not just, you know, in the school as mm. in the staff, but also in the community. And so I have always been a big believer that when we're advocating for our kids, disabled children, we're doing it, you know, with classroom teachers, with the leadership team, you know, principal, with the board, and then the wider community. And and so really looking at avenues, I would say, Sarah, to share this information. It could be little snippets where you find something that's really generic and useful for everybody and saying, hey, you know, this is a fabulous piece of information. Can we share it in the newsletter? Can we share it on the school Facebook page, you know? trying mm. to get that out there and the other thing is policy so now you know since the sort of um legislation has changed around the education and training act schools are required to really engage with their community uh before they uh, set their strategic um you know plan so to speak so yeah. that's the other point where you have the opportunity to give some input and you have the opportunity to ask for this to start happening so it's a long process, you know, it's not something that's going to happen for your child straight away because you've sort of asked. Um, but the other thing is, and I'm wondering, I've always thought about it, you know, sometimes when we as parents approach schools, it's it's harder for them because, you, you know, they might get defensive or they might feel they're being criticized. Um, what if somebody else, you know, came and did that? What if we gave them examples of, you know, the school's doing it really well, you know? connect with this principal or, you know, why don't you connect with somebody um, who is is doing this inclusion really well and, or, you know, um, neuroscience uh, relational approaches really well in um, their school and, and, you know, sort of um, this might help. So I think it's about really selling it and how do we sell it to them in terms of it benefiting everybody, not just our individual child. So I, I, that that's just my little bit, you know, in terms of how we can get it going. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ria. And I guess just what that's struck me is it's actually about separating the conversations, the immediate challenge, and the the ongoing opportunity. Mm. Mm. 
and it's really identifying it and then working at it like it's not something mm. that you've got to strategically go right you know i'm gonna approach this 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 time of the year that time of the year cultural day or you know assembly we can do a little snippet up there yeah, yes. assembly. so it's really really strategically planning it and then sort of moving ahead in terms mm. of um educating everybody yeah but look, if we if we were to get funding at Natina, I would love to do that. Just in terms of going to schools, sharing a little bit about you know, and then showing them all these different avenues. And again, I am, I you know, since I've I've become aware, I've realized you can't force things onto people. People have to feel safe enough, and they have to feel ready to come to the table. And so I've become very mindful of that, Sarah. Um that unless I create a safe space for them to come and talk to me or listen to me even, they're not going to be at the table. So that's the real thing, you know, with that relational safety. You have to build that first mm -hmm. and then you're going to be able to have anything else happening further. Um, Thank Rachel, you. you've got your hand up. Mm, sorry, one more. Might be a silly question. PB4L, is that what it is? Behaviour something, planning in primary school. Positive behaviour. Secondary alone. space. How does that fit in with this, mm -hmm. or is it judging by Linda's smile? Um, completely. I was just going to say to Freya, do we do we do we Possibly not. Gosh, they're they're going to come for our heads again. <laughs> Go, Linda. Um, well, I would just say that uh, I think I referred to it before. There are aspects of PB for L that we kept as a school, and that would be around a strong community developed values base um we call them our mana values and they're really strong touchstone for us in terms of um working with the children any restoratives we have to do because we should say that this trauma-informed approach is not about lowering our, our expectations at all you know we still have high expectations for the children particularly in terms of how they engage and respect and show mana for their peers and for their their ir core etc um, but having the PB for all values as the touchstone to bring everything back to was really important for us. Mm -hmm. We've certainly ditched a lot of the PB for all um, work uh, aspects, especially anything that's sort of located in a behaviorist theory. So the behaviorist theory, for those that don't know, is that contingency approach where you give rewards for the behavior you want to see and you give consequences for the behavior or deterrence for the behavior you don't want to see um, and any sort of point system to change behavior um yeah we have ditched i get yeah the behavior approach the shows in the yeah. title yeah yeah cool thank you yeah and I, and I think um i think it's if anything the term is misbehavior right the misbehavior we don't we always say behavior but it's misbehavior anyway and like we know through this approach it's a stress response but I'm 100% in agreement with Linda that it's the behaviorist nature of the program. And, and you've got to think when it was created, though. Like, you know, we know the 90s was the decade of the brain. The 90s wasn't actually that long ago. So the knowledge is, is reasonably new for us there. Um, but also a lot, a lot of stuff comes from clinical psychology, uh, whereas relational neuroscience, but newer. If you think about stuff in particular like neuroception, interoception, um, proprioception, what else am I missing? Uh, polyvagal theory, all these concepts have really only been developed scientifically in the last 20 years or so. So pb for all the planning for that happened prior to that. So they haven't evolved and moved with it. So it's still very behaviorist in nature. And anything where you have to, where you reward children um, showing compliance is, is a control-based theory. It's behaviorism. So it's just not appropriate. And, and in particular, if, if through programs like that and other programs, we're saying to teachers and parents that isolation is okay. You know, no human being or other animal likes being by themselves, but that's the advice we're given. Um, stuff like uh, proximal praise. So it's essentially, you know, I like what you're doing and I like what you're doing in order to affect and change the behavior of someone else is essentially um, showing that our love is conditional. So it's it's not even just that it's behaviorist, it's inhumane. And um, if you think back to like the nanny, the nanny TV show from many years ago, you know, it's like having the naughty chair. It just it just doesn't, it's not humane. And it's not inclusion and it's not about equity. And um I yeah, I'd I'd love to see what this is what I know about PB4L. 
The majority of schools that use it, they don't use PP4L. They call it PC4L, so not, there's no fidelity in it anyway. And once schools get the money, that's often the end of it, right? So I don't know why millions of dollars have been put into this rather than actually supporting schools in a more relational, more inclusive, more equitable way. So, yeah, maybe that's where our money should go. Thanks, Jace. Um, any other questions? There's one in the chat, um, Brianne. Um, oh. Is there a Te Ao Māori view of this? Jace. Yep, yeah, there is. So, so it's so Dr. Bruce Perry many, many years ago came to New Zealand and it's written in What Happened to You and changed his entire approach to therapy based on the concept of uh, Faka So, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, there, there is a model, there is a speaker on Friday night, right, Freyan? Friday night, Andre is coming to speak. Uh, yes, well, it's it's just a internal hui, yes, okay. Yeah. Right. So, so there's there is a model that's been developed. It's a um, it's a made by Māori for Māori model, um, and so that's out there. Um, again, any of these kind of um, I, I would go to Kura Kopapa, go to your local Kura Kopapa, Kuangareo, find out what they're doing. There's uh, mana potential. There's uh, Te Arawhaka mana as well. Um, lots of Te Ao Māori based approaches. Like I said, Bruce's approach changed from working with Māori. Um, so yeah, absolutely Te Ao Māori based. And when we think about restorative practice, that's an indigenous model. That's where it comes from. And it's been modified for other settings, but it's absolutely an indigenous way of doing things and dealing with things across many indigenous cultures. So yeah, absolutely. The other thing I just want to highlight here, um, you know, most of the Te Ao Māori concepts and approaches just in general are really holistic and as a parent who has been advocating for inclusion you, you know of disabled children and neurodivergent children I actually came to the realization I thought oh disability rights is one approach you know the EGL framework is another one um, and I thought actually the Te Ao Māori approach is fantastic our schools have these values right and they talk about manaki tanga and kotahi tanga and you know what does it mean and like you know is you know if I don't feel the manaki tanga you know with my children and my family then it's not happening right and so it's sometimes actually going back and questioning schools going what does this value even mean why are you using it when you know you're not including everyone and it was quite amazing. I, I really believe, you know, the, the wayata, the, you know, um, so, some of the stick games and stuff, they're all repetition and they're all rhythm that we can really incorporate into, you know, um, our, our classrooms and schools for that, you know, um, the regulation, uh, right? And and so there's so much that we can take from, uh, from Te Ao Māori um, and, and really use. And I think... One of the points, you know, when we were, before we actually formally set up, we had talked about was that we really wanted this platform to be a space where we could uh, not only talk about the Western sort of, uh, you know, approaches and perspectives around neuroscience and trauma-informed approaches, but the Te Ao Māori approaches as well, and, you know, the Te Ao Māori perspectives and understanding. And actually, there's quite a lot that's happening. So fast can space they've got some stuff happening as well uh in, in terms of supporting children through um a more te ao maori approach oops i've got somebody <laughs> that that needs to oh, go yeah. here oh, yeah. um and can i just mention that um something that's also been on both natina facebook page and the trauma-informed educators nz facebook page is um, the release of the He Awa Fidia, mm. um publication by um, Angus and Sonia McFarlane and others. And I just, that whole um, concept really speaks to me really well. So for those that don't know it, you've got the two tributaries of the river coming down side by side. One would be the Western knowledge and in this case, neuroscience knowledge. And the other is indigenous knowledge, te ao Māori flowing separately but they come together in places they separate and they come together and the McFarlane say that where they come together is where the the power is the gold so um and I think that's you know part of this journey is seeing all the synergy and making the 
connections and having those reveries about, um, you know, what Te Ao Māori says, what other Indigenous cultures and their wisdom says in this space, what the neuroscience says and what, you know, great thought leaders like um, Celia Lashley, for example, um, say in this space. Um, the other thing is, if you go to the Farauro website, they've got some reports there as well. Um, they are they've got actually a literature review, um, and they've got um a specific report around the um the what trauma informed and what healing of trauma means through the Teo Maori lens. I forget the name of the. Uh, report but it is um it is definitely there and there's lots of other literature and books as well um you know by um maori authors around um sort of the understanding of trauma through a uh, te ao maori lens and then the well-being as well um but it's based more in health uh, addiction sort of care spaces and not so much in the education space and one of the things we're really hoping is we can do something a bit more around this um and bring bring together you know drawing those parallels in the education space um for neuroscience and trauma informed approaches the western worldview and the tiao maori worldview so yeah watch out we might actually um, be able to do something in the future um there's Michelle, go ahead. You've got a question. And then I see there's a question in the chat as well. So you go ahead first, Michelle. Um, it's not really a question. I just thought, I don't know if people have seen the the latest um, NCA results that came out. The an analysis, analysis that the um, state school that scored the highest NC, highest scoring state school for NCA results was a Kura in Mangere in uh, Tapawai College. And when asked, the principal said their number one um, priority was well-being. Mm. And I just thought that just speaks volumes. Yeah. Take that, I, Minister, Minister Stanford. Exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, um, we're still waiting for the Minister's science. Remember, I've consulted the science, and the science says one hour of reading, one, what's the science? They know exactly. else knows what it is. Mm. But, but, mm. but just, just on that, could it, um, identity and well-being. That's what it is, right? Identity and well-being. So instead of peddling millions of dollars in all these models, let's just all focus on identity and well-being. Guess what? It costs nothing. No. Just open mind and open heart. Mm. Okay, so there's a question saying, what's the first step to being a trauma-informed teacher? Linda, Jace? Yeah, I think Kath answered that really well in the chat. I think it was about, you know, doing doing the reading, doing the learning, um Jace has put some YouTube um suggestions on there as well. But um I would if you haven't read this, you know, I would start here um and go from there really. Um it's difficult when you're when you're a, you know, when you're playing solo and um your leadership maybe aren't on board yet, but you can certainly start with your own space and your own class and, and your own work. Mm -hmm. And I see there's a couple of suggestions here for guest speakers. Yes, absolutely. We're more than happy to, um, you know, have suggestions for guest speakers in the future. Like I said, you know, uh, we're hoping that this is a platform for you all to interact and engage with uh, each other um, and for us to be able to support you. So um, absolutely, please do email through to me um, any suggestions you have. Um, and hopefully I can keep you guys on the list. Um, calendar invites, you'll keep getting them. Even if you don't attend, that's fine. You know, we can keep sharing notes with you because I know everybody's busy. Uh, right now, we don't have a website as such, so the Facebook page is the place where we're sort of, you know, um, sharing everything. Um, hopefully, we will have a website soon, and we'll be able to share a bit more um, that way. So, look, um, we're pretty much to the end of our um time here so i'm gonna close us with the karakia but i just want to say just yes, before yes. you do Priyan, sorry there's a question yeah. in the chat about how people can stay up to date with events and, and notices and things i guess it's just oh, joining yes. the, 
the Tina yes. Facebook page yes, and all yes. the trauma informed. So make sure you what do you do? You like and follow. I didn't realize like was one thing and follow was another thing on the pages. I'm really learning about social media, guys. So you have to like and follow and um yeah and we keep posting things over there and the other thing is if you want regular calendar invites once you send me i just copy paste the calendar list so um if i've if you've received a calendar invite for this event and that's how you're here you will get a calendar invite for the next event if you haven't if you've just come here you know copy pasting the link from the uh, event sort of link or anywhere else then please email me because otherwise you won't get the future invites um so yeah, yeah. just wanted to let you know about that um so look thank you thank you everybody jason linda thank you so much for coming um it's been an absolute privilege and absolute um you know pleasure having you guys um throughout this journey and um supporting the mahi that i'm doing so many other people are doing and really really hope that we can grow our network and keep supporting each other over here in the space yeah so i'll close us with a karakia thank, thank you, you Priya, and, and you're an amazing Chase, Linda. just thank you you know you're an amazing driver and edit a fireball of energy in this space so thank you so and follow me on instagram uh, trauma informed nz hold up yes do you want to put it in the chat jace just so people have it yes perfect all right um karakia um takamatunga kia fakairia te tapu kia watia ai te ara kia turuki fakataha ai kia turuki fakataha ai how me eh who ye like ye all righty See you, everybody. Mario. Bye. Kakite ano.